Hello and a warm welcome to everyone to today's webinar when I'm going to be speaking to some of my fantastic colleagues about the group um, ESD Outlook for 2022, which we've called the ASAP year. And to shine some light on this acronym, I am being joined by Corinne Hearn, who is our partner and co-founder of East Capital, but not the least, she is our Chief Sustainability Officer for the group. Welcome, Corinne, joining us all the way from Hong Kong. I also have David Nichols from uh, the Moscow investment team with us. And here in Stockholm, I have Hu Tseng joining us, who is the portfolio manager of our SDG Solutions Fund. Welcome to you guys as well. Thank you. Thank you. Before moving into uh, the ASAP year, I want to uh, spend a few minutes on the flows that came into ESG funds last year. The last couple of years has really been an eye opener for many investors with the ongoing pandemic, the extreme weather events across the globe, and also the release of the latest IPCC climate report. At the back of this, we saw a pickup in demand for uh, ESG funds and also an increase in interest around these questions. Karen, can we expect this trend to persist? And are we seeing any implications with this quite strong and, and fast shift in interest and allocations from investors? I think before we address the question about whether or not it will continue and, and the implications, I think it's actually worth mentioning a few numbers uh, because not everybody is aware of these numbers. Um, so first of all, if you look at the during the la last period of like 12 months, looking at inflows into funds that are labeled and categorized as ESG or sustainable funds uh, for like global equity funds, 30%, 30% of the money uh, of all the flows going into all funds have gone into this ESG and sustainable fund. Looking as well at emerging markets, for instance, which, uh, as you know, of course, is, is uh, one of our uh, uh, special uh, focus at this, in, in this capital group. Uh, if you think like three, three years ago, looking at the assets under management of funds, which were ESG funds, uh, the market share was like 3%. And now we have 11% uh, just in three years time. So it is really quite astonishing. Uh, we also found out uh, some other interesting, uh, I would say statistics or numbers uh, emphasizing this trend, uh, looking for instance at the, um, uh, the uh, basically the, the United Nations PRI, which is a very important association for any asset manager and asset owner, uh, which is serious about uh, responsible investment. Uh, the, the numbers have also like exploded in terms of assets under management and number of signatories. We do expect this to continue uh, for a number of reasons, uh, which are have to do as well, of course, with the, the interest by investors that we see when we speak to our clients, but also the fact that we think this trend is going to deploy outside of or beyond Europe, because today it's actually still a very European centered focus, where 88% uh, of all this money is actually in Europe. Uh, we do expect to, for example, based in Hong Kong, Asia, we do have a, a, a clear trend here that that is it is more and more people uh, looking at uh, sustainable investment in, uh, in these markets. Uh, in emerging markets as well, I think it's really important to see asset owners uh, which are domiciled in these emerging markets uh, becoming, uh, for instance, UN PRI signatories. There's still very few. Uh, there is not a single one in Russia. There's only one in India. There is 14 altogether in the, uh, on the um, uh, African continent and only three in China. So we definitely see that there is more to come. And uh, regarding your the second part of your question about the concrete implications that this has on markets and on investment, I'm going to give the word to uh, my colleague David in, in Moscow. 
Yes, hello everyone. Um, and I think, yeah, one of the, the, the obvious implications of these record flows is that ESG investing becomes a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy in that there's a lot of money chasing certain ESG darlings. And when we look at these stocks, the valuations are obviously extremely elevated. So one of the areas we think will be a lot in focus in 2020 and, and something we personally spend a lot of time on is that investors will start looking along the value chain um, to see, to get exposure to this sort of strong structural growth without the sort of very extreme valuations uh, that we see in, for example, some of the EV uh, electric vehicle uh, companies that are trading nowadays. The other really key focus uh, area that we think will, will be important in terms of investor investment management in 2022 is that while there's been a lot of talk about you know, how, how ESG is now part of every investment manager's approach and deeply ingrained, we think 2022 will be much more about showing how this is how this is really used in the process. And, and the example we, we, we give in our outlook is that actually, you know, we, we've been doing carbon footprinting for, uh, for a long time. We paid an external fund that uh, our companies do this, but actually we didn't, uh, the investment management team tended not to spend too much time looking at document. It was circulated by the, by the ESG team um, and, and, and really just left at that. But then over the last few years, we've developed our own carbon pricing tool. Uh, and, and, and that's when analysts and PMs actually themselves need to do the work, need to input, um, but need to look at how carbon prices will affect their portfolio companies uh, in, in, um, via a DCF. And it's then when you really start to see that the, the level of discussion and around things like carbon intensity and also on disclosure and engagement really tend to step up. So I think that's another really key theme that, that we'll be focusing on in 2022. Thank you, David. Um, so that's really good, um, helping me bridge back to the ASAP year theme. Um, so let's start looking at these four letters. The first letter is about accountability. And I'm turning to you now, Hootsi. The number of announcements made last year about uh, environment, net zero, etc., uh, and especially around COP26 must have been record high, but not much has happened so far that will have a real world impact. What do we expect from here and how much can the investment community actually do without governments taking real action? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so I think to start with, we think we should not forget that even assuming that the record high announcement made last year of being fully delivered, we're still single by emission that's expected to be almost twice as high in 2030 as necessary for the 1.5 degree pathway. So I think uh, one thing to expect going forward is that we will continue to see high pressure on the policy side because actions need to accelerate significantly in, in uh, 2022 and beyond. And we certainly hope to see more public policies, um, i.e. the rule changers uh, in the, especially the larger economies in US, in China, India and the EU as well. And we want to see the policies that incentivize the older business to be disrupted faster, scale faster with uh, also continuous uh, new investments in critical innovations. And regarding uh, the investment process, I think we're currently paying extra attention to the gap between any claims and targets and the real world impacts. Uh, that's happening at both country level and also the company level. So the execution is really the breach here. And we want to track the actual outcomes at all times. And for, for example, for the SDG Solution Fund, we have an investment process that really starts and ends with a very concrete social or environmental targets. And at each step in the process, outcome is linked with uh, specific company activities and justified with our uh, causality analysis backed by the outcome KPIs. And apart from that, we even make the distinction now between reducing um, ESG risks and seeking the more sustainable outcomes. Well, the former one is more on the financial risk mitigation side. The latter is focusing more on the non-financial impact in, re in the real world, i.e. the contribution. Uh, for example, in our view, companies that are uh, not risk um, falling to labor force disputes does not equal empowering employees uh, to thrive and get out their full potentials. Similarly, insurance companies that take climate change and biodiversity risks um, into the pricing model does not mean that biodiversity loss 
in sensitive areas is actually being turned around. So we, we do make this uh, into into integrated in, in process at the moment. Anna, may I add some? Of, of course, of course. Uh, yes. Comments yes. regarding uh, accountability, and as you said, of course, I mean, we still said that you know COP26 was was um, uh, more than we expected, but less than we hoped for. Uh, and I, I think it's uh, it's actually a great line. Um, clearly, uh, there is much more uh, to be done, as uh, Huizzi said. And what we do believe is that 2022 uh, is going to see uh, more um, work and initiatives and projects related to reporting standards, uh, because eventually accountability will be driven by investors and asset owners, asset managers alike, being able to clearly assess what, what companies uh, do and uh, so, so what we, we, for instance, we've done ourselves is developing um, a value chain analysis, SDG value chain analysis uh, tool, uh, which help us uh, actually uh, try to, to quantify the impact of, of uh, the companies towards the uh, sustainable development goals. Uh, we also see probably, we will see probably more tools such as, you know, spatial finance. We hear about, you know, different kind of solutions such as satellites helping uh, investors uh, find out uh, where the methane uh, uh, leaks and the methane uh, emissions uh, are taking place. And we will also see, um, uh, and we are, we are seeing obviously uh, a rollout of and implications of all kind of regulations uh, that have been uh, implemented or launched, and uh, you know it's the the regular ESG alphabet soup, such as the SFDR, the CSRD, the E taxonomy. But we also have recently the launch of his ESG book, which we think is very exciting, uh, like a platform for for ESG data, and uh, and the launch, of course, of the IISP, this uh, international. Uh, International uh, Sustainability uh, Board, uh, which we also think is going to be important. So accountability will be driven by a uh, lot of new requirements, regulatory uh, of so regulatory sorts, and as well some innovations in terms of, of reporting. So, Karen, um, greenwashing and uh, the issues with consistency and granularity of data uh, are often mentioned by investors as the main barriers for even greater adoption of ESD in their, you know, across their portfolios. What's your thoughts on this? Are these initiatives, regulations, tools you're mentioning, is this something you believe will help get over that barrier? Of course it will help. Uh, we need them. Uh, what we need is just, of course, uh, most more uh, harmonization, harmonization uh, across sectors. I mean, especially because a lot of, especially when we invest, for instance, in in, in companies which have operation around the world, uh, it's really difficult uh, to assess uh, when we don't have, uh, uh, you know, when we have all kind of different requirements. So it's, it's of course, it's going to help, uh, but it's tricky and it's yeah. uh, it's complicated. And I think that's where we might uh, want to move on to the next letter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's very true. Um, so our second letter is about subtleties. And um, in many lively discussions I've been on the topic of ESG, we often end up in situations when people have a lot of opinions uh, and we all agree that this is very complex and not so straightforward. Uh, we've seen some very high profile names such as uh, Chuck Fancy, the former CIO of Sustainable Investing at BlackRock, which is the world's largest asset manager. Um, he's been quite critical more recently about ESG investing and, and he um, openly called ESG investing a dangerous placebo that harms public interest. Uh, I'm turning to you now, uh, David. What do you think he means by that? And how do we actually know what is a good or bad investment decision when it comes to ESG? Yeah, absolutely. It's a, a fantastic question and one that we spend a lot of time discussing both at work and then also at home, I think. And, and, and this is one of the key areas for 2022 as well, that, that ESG is not a simple subject. There is no one answer. You know, it is very nuanced and complicated. And the answer, the explanation or the example I always like to give is that uh, BP, a few years ago, sold their Alaskan oil assets, which was considered fantastic by investors. They reduced their emissions by 8 million tonnes a year, which is obviously great news. But those assets were actually bought by a, a non-transparent private equity firm and emissions at those assets increased uh, the next year by 13 percent, or uh, sorry, by 8 percent next year. 
uh, following the divestment. So therefore, while BV investors had a cleaner stocks and maybe those uh, those oil fields did have a higher cost of capital, the world was actually worse off. So you, you have to ask yourself what, what would have been the better approach here? And, and, and that just sort of highlights, I think, some of the sort of issues that we're, we're grappling on a, a really on a day to day basis. In terms of Tariq Fancy's comments, I think firstly, they're absolutely fascinating and I would really recommend everyone to read them if you haven't already. And I think in essence, he, he is right that ESG investing is unlikely to single handedly save the world, um, especially if it is just things like excluding fossil fuel stocks from your portfolios. I mean, he, it, it is. I, I do believe, and it is the case that, that the asset, asset, asset managers, asset owners do need to mobilise huge amounts of capital to sustainable, um, sustainable investments, and in, by doing so, will slowly raise the cost of capital for the sort of more dirty, dirty companies. Um, and, and in that sense, he, that is always already the case. For example, offshore oil, oil, com, uh, oil projects now have a cost of capital around 20%, according to Goldman Sachs, whereas renewable projects have a cost of capital around 3%. So that is working. That process is taking place. Um, but but as, as Tariq said, this, this message was actually a bit complicated for his, his bosses. He wanted a much more simple message that you invest in ESG companies and you'll get our performance. But that that's that's not the case. I don't think that that, that isn't that is an overly simplistic message. Um, I think the only other the other really big area where I, I disagree with him or where we would disagree with him is that he almost completely missed the I missed the concept of engagement as a, a sort of very powerful tool to impact the companies we invest in and perhaps because BlackRock aren't particularly strong in that area. And I mean, we've seen firsthand so many times that the amount of impact one can have is is really remarkable. And, and, and so, yeah, that's that's the other sort of big, uh, so, big important area. Yeah, I, I um one of the um, big kind of questions that um, revolves around, you know, divest to engage. Uh, we've seen a lot of discussions on that, and and several big asset owners have kind of thrown in the towel on ownership of fossil uh, fuel uh, related uh, businesses during last year. How do you think this trend will develop? And and I mean, where do we stand on that? Yeah, no, this is, this is another sort of golden question. And, and the easy answer that we can give is that what Bill, Bill Gates said is that divestment has so far reduced zero tonnes of emissions. Uh, obviously, once you sell the stock, you have zero ability to actually influence it. Um, and if you look at the science, what we need is emissions reductions now, you know, in, in one year, in two years, in three years, um, rather than the sort of longer term, which you would imagine would be the impact of sort of divestment. And so fundamentally, I, I think, it, it, engagement has to be the sort of the first, well, we would think the first choice of um, of asset managers, assuming you, you you feel you can do it in the proper way you have. Uh, and for, for us, engagement works when you have the local presence, the language skills, the contacts and and, and the size. And, and for example, with capital, while actually most of our funds don't invest in fossil fuels in Russia and Eastern Europe, we do because we have that presence. You know, I've, I've been actually my entire career I spent on Russian oil and gas. I started off as an oil and gas analyst 10 years ago. So I do have the context. I do have the knowledge. I do have the language skills. And so actually we're seeing that there's there's an enormous amount of impact. And if you think about companies like like Gazprom, for example, who are the largest emitter in the world on scope one and two, you know, I, I'm, I'm currently leading the, the Climate Action 100 engagement there. And, and the, the amount of progress they're making is, is really remarkable. Um, emissions there fell by 23 million tonnes last year, 13% or 12% reduction, which is actually more than most of the other oil and gas majors. So there is, we are already seeing the real world impact. Obviously, it's not just due, due to me or due to investors, but, but it is clearly having an effect if you believe the company. Um, so, yeah, I think it, it engagement absolutely has a very important role to play. Um, although I, I probably do expect that the divestment movement will, will if anything, uh, continue to accelerate largely because of sort of uh, pressure from the ultimate ultimate shareholders and or ultimate investors. And, and yeah, we, we absolutely understand that. So thank you, David. Um, Corinne, did you want to add something? Yeah, I, I, I think what I wanted to add, and I think it's it's very interesting that the um, uh, we are discussing in general, not only here today, but but in 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 the space of responsible finance, this question about um, uh, fiduciary duty and ownership of the problems. Uh, like David was mentioning, the uh, the BP uh, example. Uh, what we uh, we are worried about the, the trend of decarbonization of portfolios by just excluding 
everything that is brown because it does have a second impact on the actual the fact that people would be pushing companies to divest from their most polluting assets and as as um, uh, david was mentioning well if these polluting assets end up being no longer in the public equity space, but in the private equity space, there would definitely be much less scrutinability. So it is it is a problem, and that's something that is actually uh, very much in line what we, we we have developed throughout the years at this capital something called uh, know your owner kyo uh, and it's very important for us who is the owner of the assets when we invest into into a company and there that's where we have an issue where when when there's this divestment uh, tsunami uh, you have a number of assets uh, going into in the hands of people who who care much less about this uh, this topic so it's really important and then the second and last thing i wanted to to um, to mention about that is we, we have just this true belief that be, because we all want to have a real world impact, one should not starve of capital companies who are actually working and reducing emissions. So it, it is really, really important. Otherwise, well, yeah, we won't solve uh, we won't solve anybody's problem. And then we're back to Tarek uh, criticism uh, uh, about the fact that it's not going to save us uh, just with ESG investing. If ESG investing is only about uh, about uh, green and and uh, fossil fuel uh, free fossil fuel free uh, portfolios. Thank you, uh, Karen and, and David. Um, so now I um, I want to move into our third letter, which is adaptation. Um, and we've recently seen great scientific evidence that climate change is happening around us. Uh, the same is true for loss in biodiversity. So. Hootsie, I would be interested to hear your um, comments and thoughts around what are the risks that investors are facing if they are, they are ignoring these risks and also given the amount of attention that this topic has received during the last years, are these not risks that we can expect to be already priced in to the markets? Yeah. I think on this question and the biodiversity question, it's certainly happening or it's already happened uh, to, to a great extent and the people are being more aware of it right now. But the risk that we're not, I think we're not yet fully pricing in uh, in the market is that some industries will be actually significantly affected. For example, take food sector, uh, for instance, uh, because of loss of biodiversity, the input prices, farming, cost can significantly increase and that leads to higher operational expenses uh, in these sectors and some other sectors like tourism for example can can just completely dis disappear in certain regions because of um, the diversity loss um, and uh, and also because the the biodiversity issue it, it's interlinked with climate change but not exactly the same thing and there are actually quite com a lot of complications into that as well. So I think currently people are struggling with uh, assessing companies' exposure to fully uh, ex uh, analyze these risks in a very systematic way. Um, and also I think it's good though, on the opposite side is we're seeing new newer standards and initiatives that are helping investors and companies to address this. For example, we're, we're seeing the first beta version of the task force on, on natural relate, nature related financial disclosures framework that will be released in, in the first quarter of this year uh, that will provide a clear framework um, that we can discuss with the exposed companies on biodiversity specifically and uh, we ourselves actually also sign a, uh, have a policy now in place within this capital group including Speria on biodiversity so so i think things are moving in the right, right direction uh, but there are more to be done to be able to fully pricing these risks yeah, thank you. Um, speaking about um, pricing in these risks and, and um, governance has always been kind of the key um, component for asset pricing in emerging markets. Um, do we think that will change to be more kind of nature environment related, David? Yeah, well, I think we this is off the question that we get because actually our ESG scorecard, 75% of the weight is still on governance. And actually people often ask us, how are you going to increase the weight of ENS? And, and our answer so far is, is no, because actually governance is still at the core of it. You know, it's, it's about having a, a good, good, well-balanced board with a diverse range of competencies. It's about having a proper remuneration structure. 
It's about having um, bank transparency and how you report on these things. So I think that, that, that governance still has the, the, the main impact. And not to forget that actually, it, you know, we, we're not, we don't just invest on ESG criteria. It's like capital allocation generally for companies, how they invest is still going to be the main driver of stock performance, what kind of returns they get on the capital they invest. So, uh, so governance will still remain important. Uh, will, will remain, I think, or we think the most important factor. Having said that, I absolutely think that the ENS will will become increasingly important. And how I actually see it, or how we see it in the next couple of years, is that what, if you're looking at something like a retail company, you you look at dividend yield, you look at growth, you look at price earnings, but then you also look at something like carbon intensity per square meter of shopping space they have, because because there's there's so much now. It, it, it's it's something we, we spend so much time on. Um, you know, 50% of the asset managers now now are also thinking about setting portfolio targets for themselves. But this will just become one of the one of the discussion points that we have with companies. So I think I, I really think it will become more important. And this particularly this metrics based approach and so not just do you have a policy or what do you think about this? You know, what is your actual number? How much how much emissions have you actually reduced in the last two years? What have you done? How what will it look like in two years in three years? How can we include this in our models? So yeah, that's that's where we see it going, and, and that is absolutely already starting, and we're already starting to to, to look at those sort of metrics. Thank you, David. Uh, speaking about you know organisations, etc. Um, all our all organisations consist of people, and if you don't understand people, you don't understand business. That's a quote that is well known within management, but people is also the last dimension that we think will shape the ESG world going forward. What do we actually mean by that, Karen, and what has changed uh, here over the years? Well, yes, P for people, it could have been S for social, uh, uh, definitely something that we hear much more about from companies. We are ourselves spending more time on these topics. Uh, this started with uh, COVID-19, with all the implication it had on starting by, you know, health and safety, uh, for uh, how companies were dealing with uh, with the pandemic, uh, but also about uh, talent retention in a in a world where the the it seems like you know the relationship between companies and their staff has changed, and we hear about uh, you know, issues such as labor disruption because of that, or even you know, salary inflation, all kind of elements which make us think that. The, the, the P of the people is becoming a much more central, critical issue to understand when uh, when you're looking into uh, into ESG. So, uh, 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 you know, we, we have uh, written in our in our outlook uh, a number of examples, uh, but I, just to pick a, a couple of them, uh, for instance, in China, where uh, where I work, I've been working for now more than 10 years uh, in the tech industry. We've always had uh, this, uh, uh, this something called the, the, the 669. So basically uh, working, uh, uh, no, sorry, 699, uh, working six days a week from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Just a couple of years ago, that's uh, something that some of the, um, the top uh, uh, leaders and managers of, uh, of these tech companies were proudly claiming that that was a it was part of the, or the core of the company culture and uh, something that nobody was thinking is an issue. Of course, it is an issue. And now it's something that, that actually companies are backing on peak time and they're even putting some, some regulations uh, uh, around it. Uh, so back, you know, the, the people being as well, of course, your staff and your employees to try to understand these uh, regulations and all of this um, all of these uh, elements. I also would like to say we just uh, got, I think today or was it yesterday, the World Economic Forum just published its, uh, uh, the latest uh, update of uh, their top risk and you know they're asking people around the world, they've been doing that for many years, about what they think would be the most important risk in, but looking at it not, not just 2022 but you know like 10 years forward and, uh, and social cohesion, erosion, uh, has just come up. Uh, that's nothing that uh, it's, it's new, and uh, it's also related, of course, to uh, to again the fact that in 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 many places around the world we have uh, more inequalities, and uh, we've had uh, governments uh, sometimes not addressing uh, these issues in in the right way. So we do think that for anybody serious about uh, responsible investing and and ESG investing, uh, the importance uh, of focusing more on the uh, the people uh, is uh, is really critical. Thank you, Karen. Um, so 
thinking about you know what what Corinne just discussed uh, Hootsie, do you see any kind of implications in terms of the investment process uh, and allocations uh, at the back of this? Mm, absolutely. I think if we want to look at the, the SDG fundings, for example, currently, um, currently the SDG fundings globally is heavily focused on climate change and related goals, uh, where 44% of total funding goes into that. Well, actually, in the SDG requirements, uh, the funding requirements, um, it's it's only 20% of that uh, requirements related to climate issues. So there's an over allocation to climate at the moment. On the other hand, there's an under allocation on the social related goals. So social SDGs represent actually over half of the overall funding needs, while currently only 30 percent ish actual funding goes uh, into that by the industrial, uh, by the financial industry leaders. Uh, so I, I do see a gap there. Um, and besides that, I think regionally there's also some imbalances currently. Uh, for example, the, the majority of the carbon strategy capital goes into um, advanced economies um, rather than uh, developing countries where actually social issues, people issues are even, even bigger there. Um, so I think from an allocation perspective, I do see there's a strong implications on on the on the theme as well as on the regions. Uh, in process wise, we do have a very strong element actually incorporates uh, the general people factor um, from a contribution perspective by the companies in, in the in the uh, in our kind of criteria and scorecard as well. So yes, and that's going to be something we, we we put even more focus on in 2022 and beyond. Thank you. Um very much for that. If uh, you as an attendee of this webinar would be interested to um, learn more about the four letters, accountability, subtleties, adaptation and people, we're going to be published our written ESG outlook uh, on the website later this week. You're also more than welcome to get in touch with myself personally, or uh, I'm happy to kind of set up a meeting with any of the um, uh, my colleagues on this webinar today to further discuss these very important topics. To wrap up today's discussion, I would be very interested to hear from our panelists beside these four letters, which made a nice sounding A set. Uh, is there any aspect that you personally think will shape the responsible financing world beyond 2022? And I'm going to start with you, Corinne. Yeah, so that's exciting because uh, we we knew we had to prepare to this question, but we did not discuss with within with our with our yeah. colleagues uh, what the answer is. So let's see. Maybe we'll have the same yeah. answer. I would go for letter O for outcome and uh, oh, I can see here maybe so it was the same as my uh, colleagues. I don't know. No. Oh, what do we mean by that? I, I, and I, actually, of course, that's, these are things we discussed today, but I think there was a real focus that needs to ha be happening on the real world impact of ESG investing. We discussed that through engagement. We discussed that through uh, allocation. We discussed that as well through uh, uh, the uh, finding metrics uh, to to be able to define uh, what we do and what is the the um, the impact. So basically, have a real uh, perspectives on 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 the result of the work. And why is it needed? Well, it is because it is the us up here. It's urgent. There are a lot of things that need to be happening uh, as soon as possible and uh, urgently needed. So I will go for the letter O for outcome. Thank you, Corinne. Um, yeah, so let's move over to Hootsie then. So uh, yeah, you get it right. I actually have the same word here, outcome. And I don't think it's a bad thing. That's <laughs> because it really reflect that we, we do internally within the team think along the same lines. And I think I will give two explanations for that. For outcome, why is that important uh, beyond 2022? Because I can see that um, we mentioned in the first questions that there are significant gaps between the claim statements and the actual real world impacts. So there are a lot of pressure to deliver that. And that has to come down to the actual uh, KPIs and outcomes we are we are tracking at the yeah. investment level. And, and another thing is the companies now, especially in the European region, they also have the regulatory uh, 
kind of uh, requirements and expectations. And uh, so far, of course, people are making a, a new policies targets in, in line with that. But again, uh, these have to land on material uh, outcomes as well. So there are a lot of, uh, I would say, substantial contents that need to justify uh, what we're doing across the space, uh, both at the regulatory policy side, but also at the corporate side. So Thank yes, you. again, outcome. <laughs> Thank you, Huti. Uh, I think it's very interesting that you've uh, chosen the same letter, uh, but also, as you say, um, it's also good to see that we kind of have the same perspective of, of all of this. Now, we all extremely um, <laughs> curious about hearing David's letter, and if that's going to be outcome as well, I might actually think that you've cheated and talked to each other before. <laughs> Uh, but, so yeah, David, don't say how to come, please. No, well, no. I, I mean, unfortunately, unfortunately, it's not actually. No, my my letter is is G for governments, uh, and probably as you've heard on this, on what we've said so far, you know, government action needs to significantly, significantly step up, and and when it does, I think that will have a very significant implication on the on the portfolio companies and on the world we live in. Um, and so it, it's it's all about seeing exactly what they what they will be able to do in terms of tangible outcomes. As, as our colleagues were mentioning, so it is linked. Um, so yeah, that, that's what we're really looking forward, uh, to forward to. Thank you, David. No, it's all very interesting. And I think there's been um, a lot of very interesting discussions today. Um, there's, we can you know, sit down for hours and hours and, and discuss this topic, uh, but unfortunately we are running out of time now. Uh, so unless anyone uh, on the panel today would like to give a final word, um, I'm going to uh, wrap this up now. Thank you everyone who has joined us today. Uh, we have recorded this um, webinar, so it's going to be made available through social media channels uh, later this week as well. Uh, and I hope to see you soon again when we're going to give more uh, digital events uh, this spring. Thank you.